YouTube. I'm uh, here in my car as you can see I'm multitasking um, this video is going to be a continuation on that uh, gin interview with uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley late Rosemary Ellen Guiley um, she wrote the book uh, the gin connection and she has this kind of interesting theory that uh, all of the supernatural phenomena is actually gin and I find this really interesting from a theological perspective as an Islamic theologian, as well as a historian of Islamic thought, because here we have parts of Islamic thought that are uh, going into the West and into New Age religion and into uh, the supernatural community, if you will. And she wrote the book specifically to bring uh, knowledge of the jinn to a general non-Muslim Western audience. And I, I commend her for that. And I feel like the connections that she's made to other supernatural entities with the jinn is very valid. You know, she tries to say like shadow people, um, lizard people, for instance, or maybe the chubacabra or or, or or bigfoot the yeti like all these kind of supernatural things ghosts uh alien sightings or abductions and these types of things um they're related to the jinn because the jinn are shape shifters and they they can change their form and take on any form and this particular interview they called it uh like jinn in the dreams because she is specifically talking about in some parts how the jinn can influence your dreams or even you know kind of uh, the pre-dream state and so you know not all jinns are benevolent some are malevolent some are out to get you some are bad jinn some are good jinn some are your allies some are your foes and so we have to be uh, aware of these entities and not be so quick to just say, oh, this is aliens. Oh, these are ghosts or, oh, this is, you know, whatever superstition uh, or mythological being or creature might be out there, or supernatural phenomena. So, you know, uh, the jinn uh, is for especially a believing Muslim a very rational explanation for all of these types of phenomena out there. Now, I'm not trying to discredit other supernatural phenomena. You know, aliens may actually exist. That's a possibility. Islamic theology does not deny the existence of aliens or, you know, other type Bigfoot or, you know, whatever. But uh, maybe some of the more unexplainable kind of sightings or experiences that are ineffable for people maybe uh jinn might be a plausible explanation and so the interview here is another interview from coast to coast again with uh george nuri um who's the host uh you know he's a very great host and i like i said before i used to listen to this uh radio show when i worked overnights at a eyeglass factory one of my co-workers used to play it on the radio. He was into this kind of thing. And I mean, it was probably the most interesting thing that was on radio in the middle of the night. It wasn't much else. And there's also, you know, with Coast to Coast, they also give you kind of like general news or political news as well, um, besides just the supernatural stuff. So it was kind of a fun program to listen to. And it's still an ongoing program. Um, so that's, you know, my plug there for Coast to Coast. And uh, I think you should listen intently to these theories because I, I find them convincing and I find them very interesting. Um, I don't believe you know everything wholeheartedly, but it's a very interesting conversation to be had from a theological perspective and also as a historian of religion. Um, it's very interesting how there's cross pollination between Islam and new age religion movements or the supernatural community or however you want to label it or call it um 
you know, that jinn are being talked about not just by Muslims, but by people who are into other types of belief systems is, is personally fascinating to me. Um, so without further ado, I'll let you guys uh, get to the raw interview here. And thank you very much. And don't forget to subscribe, comment, like, or check out my Patreon page. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie. Honored tonight to have Rosemary Ellen Guiley with us. She is also, of course, our co-author with our book, The Talking to the Dead. She's written one called The Jinn Connection. Rosemary has worked full-time in the paranormal and metaphysical field since 1983. She's a consulting editor of Fate Magazine, publishing also her own newsletter. And here she is back on Coast to Coast. Rosemary, how are you? Hi, George. Busy as ever. It sure is great to be back on the show. Yeah, you sure are. You're everywhere. You were also a guest of mine on Beyond Belief. You did a great job. People are still sending me emails about your performance on that program. I can't wait to see it. I know. It's coming up. It'll be on a Friday. And, uh, of course, uh, if, uh, if, you're, if you're looking at it, you can also record it and keep it and look at it forever, Rosemary. Anyways, this is a fascinating subject. I talked a, a week or so ago about the gin, but they just seem to be cropping up more and more. Give me your explanation on just what the gin might be. They are a race of supernatural beings who are attached to the earth. They were here on the earth before us. And, in fact, they had dominion over the earth, which they lost to us. They live in a parallel dimension. In earlier times, um, people believe they lived underground or they just retreated to very remote areas. But in modern terms, it really makes sense as a parallel dimension. They have access to our world, and there are those among them who aren't very friendly toward us. They're not all bad. They're not all good, just like human beings. But some of them have a lot of hostility towards humans. I believe based on my research of years and years tracking these entities throughout the paranormal realm, that they account for a lot of our negative experiences, hauntings, possession, um, entity encounters, and also abductions, including Mm. the ET abduction phenomenon. All right, we're going to get into all this. Now, the Middle Eastern folklore of genies, genies popping out of the bottle and things like that, are they tied into the jinn? Absolutely, that's exactly what we're talking about. The word genie came from the term jinn, which means the hidden ones. Uh, They've always been kind of hidden from people. They don't want us to know what they're doing. But when old Arabian folk tales, which are collected into a body of works called the Arabian Nights, when those were translated for the Western audiences into French and English, uh, some of the French translations translated jinn as genie. And that's actually kind of a corruption of uh, the term genius, which is a Roman spirit of place. Uh, so jinn is really the correct name for these entities, but they became embedded in our popular culture as the genie in the bottle. Where did they come from, Rosemary? How did they develop? There are different stories about their origins. One very ancient Arabian legend says that they, uh, they came from the winds. They were literally primordial wind spirits, and they were often responsible for ill winds that blew, bringing in disease and bad luck. Uh, in the Quran, they're explained as uh, pre-existing humans created from a substance called smokeless fire. So the jinn have really no known form, no no physical form that we can identify with. Uh, but they have the ability to shape-shift. They can shape-shift into human forms. They can shape-shift into animal forms. They especially like to shape-shift into weird forms that are sometimes half-animal, half-human, or combinations of creatures. Could they be fallen angels, Rosemary? There are a lot of parallels between the bad jinn and fallen angels. Uh, for example, the Quran tells the story that uh, the jinn lost their place in, in uh, this world and in paradise because they refused to bow to humans when God created humans. At the beginning, there were angels and jinn. Uh, then along came humans, and uh, God issued the instructions to the angels to bow to the humans, his new creations. The angels did. The jinn, who had free will, said no, because these new entities are inferior to us. And so they were pushed out uh, in consequence. 
and the angry ones uh, then become the evil jinn who who follow um, a leader named Iblis, whose name means he who is despaired. And uh, the jinn all have to leave, and uh, the bad ones then um, torment people, and uh, they are granted a reprieve until Judgment Day to prove their case that human beings are unworthy. So the the jinn are like humans: the good, the bad, and the ugly. They have different um, motivations, different intentions. Uh, they have their own factions of terrorists. Uh, just like humans do, and uh, we interact with those angry ones. We now, can also interact with uh, more benevolent ones, but I do believe that most of our interactions with them are negative because these are the ones who are making the effort to act out against human beings. How do we know we're not being tricked? If If we interact with the benevolent ones, how do we know they're really not the evil ones? Well, sometimes that proves to be the case, and uh, we see this a lot in entity contact experiences where um, an entity starts out as Mr. Nice Guy, even assumes a a human-like personality, and then once they have an attachment to a person, they they turn and they become more manipulative, controlling, Mm -hmm. negative. Uh, They can really wreak havoc with a person. Throughout the literature on jinn, going back centuries and centuries, when they are described, they are most often described as vengeful by nature and very deceitful, that they're untrustworthy. And so even if we, are think, even if we think we're dealing uh, with them in a positive way, uh, they might be able to turn the tables on us at any time. Rosemary, the fact that folklore and legend talks about the jinn so often, what does that tell you about the real possibilities that these entities might be real? They are real. Uh, I've had encounters with a variety of entities over the course of my research, some of them positive, some of them ambivalent, and and some of them quite hostile. And uh, I believe that they, uh, the jinn, comprise um, quite a, a hidden portion of our entity contact experiences. They masquerade as other entities that we know by other names. We might think we're dealing with a demon when we're really dealing with jinn. There's no way to scientifically prove these entities, but we have hundreds and hundreds of years of persuasive anecdotal experience where people describe the same sorts of experiences over and over again around the planet throughout time, the same core experiences with certain behaviors, certain characteristics. That says to me that we clearly have had interactions with otherworldly beings from the time we first came on this planet. You know, when people get possessed, could it be, you know, the evil jinn that might be doing that? Or is that a demon of some type. They do have the capability of possessing people and animals as well. Many times I think we're dealing with jinn in possession cases when we think we're dealing with demons. I've often been asked, well, how do you know the difference? Because if the jinn can act in demonic ways, um, how do we know whether or not we're dealing with demons or with jinn? And oftentimes it is hard for experts, investigators, Uh, people who do uh, exorcisms and releasements, it is hard to know the difference. Many times the jinn are very difficult to cast out, and uh, they often have very selfish motives for attaching to people. They want something for themselves. It's it's, uh, uh, not not a a spiritual battle for the soul, but more a, a takeover for their own purposes. They will, however, absorb and use soul energy. What causes them to show up in someone's life? Do they get conjured up by the individual? How do they show up? Sometimes they they do come because uh, people have either deliberately or even unwittingly called them in by um, experimenting with magical practices or uh, sometimes even spirit communication. They're often attracted to people who make the wrong decisions. Uh, they want power. They, they want uh, control. They want uh, wealth. They, they want to manipulate people. And uh, these people then become easy manipulation targets for the jinn because 
um, many of them like to sow the seeds of chaos. Uh, they can also be attracted to people who have weakened defenses. They're in poor health. They're in emotional trauma. And these sorts of, of emotions seem to be a source of food for a lot of opportunistic entities. I think also they watch us. Uh, they might track individuals or families for generations and monitor them for how they might be useful to them. Do they take physical form, Rosemary? They can. They can appear as real people. They can acquire forms that are solid, uh, that can wrestle with people and grab people. Uh, they... Uh, can be very beautiful, they can be very monstrous. It depends on what effect they want to have on the people they've targeted. Now, when they interact with human beings and they come through these various sources, I assume they can also sneak through a Ouija board, can't they? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, uh, some of the negative entities that show up frequently uh, on Ouija boards are quite likely jinn. Uh, I uh, believe that the entity known as Zozo, uh, who is a, a negative entity particularly associated with the Ouija boards, Zozo and various other Z names it goes by, uh, that Zozo is a djinn. Where are they in terms of in the cosmos? I mean, are they in a, du- a different dimension? Are they in the bowels of the planet? Where, where the heck are these things? In lore, they live underground. They like remote areas, caves, tunnels, wastelands. I've encountered them in uh, remote areas in America, uh, especially in areas where there have been a lot of mining operations. But from a modern perspective, they exist in a parallel dimension. We have uh, a number of dimensions that are in our universe, which really is a multiverse. These are all connected to Earth. Uh, so they have a tie to the, the physical planet of the Earth, but being in another dimension, they are at a different vibrational rate in their natural state, and so we don't see them or encounter them most of the time. They're sort of a, uh, around a corner, so to speak, but um, they are capable of coming into our world when, when people call them in or they find thin spots, uh, these portal areas that are... Uh, all over the planet where the boundaries between dimensions are very permeable. If you were to see one of these things uh, walking down the street, what would it look like? What would it be wearing? Nobody really knows what the true form of the jinn is. Uh, in ancient lore, they favor forms like snakes, uh, reptilian forms, uh. animal forms, black dogs. Uh, but one could walk down the street and we might not even know it. According to ancient lore, however, that even when they take beautiful human forms, there's something about them that gives them away if you know what to look for. I think that there are these beings uh, moving around on the planet. They don't seem to have the capability to stay for uh, long periods of time, but they do come and mingle with us. And uh, there are even uh, hybrids. I do believe that we have a variety of hybrids that have uh, come onto the planet, and it's very difficult to tell them from us. These, uh, these forms that they take, uh, you know, different animals, things, you know, we, we I saw, for example, remember the movie The Omen? That, yes. uh, that do, Was it a Rottweiler? What was it, that kind of dog? It was a Doberman or a Rottweiler? I it, think was it was a Rottweiler. A, yeah. That, I mean, would a gin do something like that? Yes. Uh, they will take whatever form suits their purpose. Uh, They're famous, for example, as uh, black dogs, and black spectral dogs uh, have been in folklore all over the planet. With red eyes, too, right? Oftentimes with red eyes. I believe they account for a lot of our mysterious creature encounters, these creatures that should not be, you know, the monster birds, the animals that seem to be composed of four or five different species, uh, or monstrous sorts of animals. People often encounter them when they're out in remote areas, and uh, they have a a surprise when they're camping or walking down a trail. These might be forms of gin. What do they want, Rosemary? What are they after? 
they have a variety of motives. Uh, you know, just like human beings have a variety of, of motives. Some of them are on a campaign of terror against us, and literally they want their homeland back. They want the planet back. They want to have dominion over it again. Others are uh, interested in tormenting us for their own um, food source. Uh, they get energy off of us for their um, their own amusement or entertainment. Some of them actually become infatuated with us, and they want to attach to people and follow them around and even have romantic re- relationships with them. Some of them are tricksters. Uh, so we have a variety of agendas going on. But the the concentration of our engagement with them seems to be in the negative uh, arena. When we have persistent hauntings that are very troubling and draining to people and cannot be resolved, certain possession cases, and many of these uh, abductions that uh, we've attributed to extraterrestrials, uh, I believe the jinn are major players in all of these activities. Whether or not they account for them all, it's hard to say. I have talked to researchers who say, look, it's all gin. Uh, the, they account for everything paranormal, all the aliens, all the ghosts, all the, all the wow. uh, spirits. In my own research, I can see a major presence of the gin, but I haven't become convinced myself yet that they account for everything. In, in ancient Irish folklore, they talked about leprechauns, might they have been gin as well? One of the startling things about my research, uh, comparing gin to other entities, was the similarity between fairies and gin, and, and including leprechauns in that. In fact, there are so many similarities in terms of their origins, how they got pushed out of the planet, where they went, what their abilities are, how they interact with people, what their strengths and weaknesses are it's possible to say that jinn and fairies are probably one and the same. Well, we know all the stories about leprechauns, don't we? This would be fascinating if they were indeed one in the same, doing whatever they do. You know, a lot of our Celtic ancestors, which is where we get most of our fairy lore uh, in our culture from, they were frightened of fairies. Uh, the fairies were beings with tremendous powers who did not hold human beings in high regard, and you wanted to stay out of their way. We find a similar pattern with the jinn. Uh, now, there are benevolent fairies. Uh, you know, the fairies like us, they're not all one or the other. We, we tend to want to make things all good or bad when we look at the spirit world. Uh, we want definitive explanations and descriptions, and those are very difficult to do when you're dealing with entities that morph from one shape to another. So I do believe that uh, there are many beneficial fairies, and many of them are willing to work with people, for example, to cultivate amazing uh, gardens with uh, plants that have a very high spiritual vibration that can be used in medicine. So it's, it's a very varied picture. Not many people in the West, Rosemary, would be familiar with the gin. Now, if you said genies, they'd think of the TV show, I Dream of Genie or Sinbad or something like that. But not many of them would know what a gin would be. Would you agree? Absolutely, George. And much of the rest of the world is very familiar with, with the gin. They just didn't make it onto our paranormal radar and our, our culture. They got uh, subsumed into the folktale and fairy lore, the genie in the bottle. And consequently, people think of them as uh, a fantasy, as something silly and quirky and goofy. That's how they're often portrayed in uh, television and, and films. When actually outside of our culture, the jinn are known as their their real name and their real powers, and they are uh, regarded with uh, a lot of respect and um, even wariness. So, Rosemary, when we come back, I-, I want to see how you put this connection between jinn and shadow people and even ET abductions. We'll be back. Coast Insiders, the new version of the Coast to Coast AM app is now available for iPhone and now Android 4.0 and above. Listen live or on demand anywhere, anytime. Go to coasttocoastam.com and download it today. 
And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie with Rosemary Ellen Guiley. She also is an expert in dreams. We'll talk with her about dreams next hour. Rosemary, this connection between the jinn and E.T. abductions, shadow people, tell me about the connection. I was led into the E.T. abduction arena through shadow people. I started researching shadow people almost 10 years ago. Uh, in 2004, I started getting a lot of emails from people spontaneously from all over describing terrifying bedroom visitations by these dark figures that, that looked like they were made entirely of shadow. They had uh, solid form to them when they wanted yet they could disappear through walls. They looked like the silhouettes of tall men wearing coats and often hats. And so in 2005, I decided to launch a formal study project to figure out what these entities were because they, they defied categorization. They didn't mm-hmm. seem to be ghosts. They, even though they seemed to be evil to people, they didn't act like demons either. What were they? And so I collected hundreds of anecdotes from people, testimonies about their experiences, and began breaking them down into patterns, uh, what the entities look like, um, the conditions in the experiencers, life, behavior, etc. And I discovered in the course of that that um, many of these shadow people experiencers were also ET abductees and or had had significant encounters with entities or major sightings, but the abduction theme was very prominent. And I haven't run into that with a lot of other entity contact experiences uh, to such a degree. So it it, um, made me wonder what really was going on. So some simultaneous things happened. Uh, I concluded after years of studying the shadow people that they were jinn, that this is a major form taken by jinn. And they also have a presence in the ET abduction scenario. I went back through the abduction literature, uh, going back to cases from the 1950s. I talked to abduction researchers. I found evidence for shadow people uh, throughout the abduction literature. And yet connections between the shadow people and what was going on in the abductions were never quite well made. Uh, They were considered to be just you know, one of those side phenomena, they would often precede abductions, sometimes by weeks, months, even years. Uh, Abductees might start with shadow people experiences in childhood and then later on uh, go into the full-blown abductions. Uh, The shadow people weren't often coming along with the abducting uh, entities, but they seemed to be an advanced guard. So there was a definite connection if shadow people are a form of jinn and the shadow people have a major presence in the ET abduction phenomenon, then that means the jinn are heavily involved in that. Uh, they may, might be working in cooperation with other entities. They might be uh, working in, in conflict, in competition with other entities for us. They probably shapeshift into other entity forms so that we think we're dealing with the greys, for example, or with reptilians or with a host of other uh, forms. Sometimes these are one-off forms. They look more like beings from a fairy book than what we would associate with visitors from outer space. I believe the abduction scenario is not really an outer space thing anyway. Uh, I don't rule out that that we could be visited by beings from off-world planets, but the evidence for it being an interdimensional experience is much stronger. These are entities really coming from dimensions attached to Earth. And uh, these sorts of observations and conclusions have been in the the ufological literature for some time, but the jinn have not been present. Uh, So in in writing The Jinn Connection, and um, I did go into this uh, some in The Vengeful Jinn, which came out a couple of years ago, uh, my purpose here is to uh, bring the gin to the attention of the Western audience and especially to investigators and researchers and say, here's, uh, here's an entity that's active in these kinds of experiences and they're not on our radar. We need to know about them. We need to factor them into our analyses, our considerations, 
because that's going to determine how we can respond to these, how we can protect ourselves, how we can end things, how we can ward things off. You know, Rosemary, if they're coming from other dimensions and they're not strictly physical and they're abducting humans, doing biological experiments on them, what the heck do they want? One of the themes that's come out in the ET abduction literature, which applies to Jin as well, is the hybrid program. We have all of these abductees who say that they have uh, been taken for the sole purpose of their reproductive material. Female abductees have talked about being impregnated and having their, um, their fetuses removed. Mm-hmm. They have sometimes been reacquainted with the hybrid offspring. They've been told various things. Uh, one of the stories is that um, the ETs need our genetic stock to replenish uh, their own stock uh, because they've become depleted. I believe there's a darker thing going on. I, I don't think, I think the abduction so. scenario has anything to do with uh, the best interests of human beings or uh, raising humans into any sort of spiritual awareness. It's abusive, it's manipula- manipulative, and it victimizes us. These are not benevolent entities doing that. Well, the jinn would have such a motive as well for if they have a faction of them that want to come back into this world and anchor in on a more permanent basis again. Uh, they don't seem to be able to acquire a form to do that. So one of the ways to do it would be through a hybrid where you could incorporate the genetics wow. of the dominant species on the planet uh, and merge that with your own abilities and raise those hybrids in an environment that would be um, a le- have allegiance to their cause. This is what the ETs are supposed to be doing, and this would fit a jinn agenda as well. So if I'm hearing you right, Rosemary, you're saying the jinn might have been responsible for just about every kind of activity on this planet that people have assumed might have been extraterrestrial. They have a finger in everything. What we don't know is what is the extent of their involvement. Are they uh, the majority of our experiences, some of our experiences? Does it shift around? Uh, As I mentioned a little earlier, I have consulted researchers all around the planet in different cultures from different religious perspectives, and there are some who say the jinn account for everything. And since they are hidden uh, and they, they really don't tell us what they're doing, uh, nor do the abducting ETs. They're not being, uh, those entities aren't being honest with us either. We don't really know. And it seems like we don't want to deal with it. We don't want to think about it. It's, the abductions are fringe things that happen to fringe people, somebody else, when actually uh, what is going on affects all of us. If we are... Uh, the victims of a Trojan horse sort of campaign, at some point that's going to turn against us in very unfavorable ways. One of the researchers that I consulted in England uh, made the observation that uh, the jinn uh, are coming through these dimensional barriers in relatively small numbers now, but their plan is to come through many more strong. And uh, if we are unprepared, um, it could be very disastrous for human beings. Men in black, what might they be? Another form of gin. Uh, and early on in my shadow people research, I couldn't help but make the connection between shadow people and men in black. Here was another link to the ET phenomena as well. Uh, men in black um, are... The, the classic uh, men in black are male figures dressed in dark suits and clothing, uh, driving around in black cars often, and intimidating uh, ET experiencers and witnesses. They have odd characteristics about them. This would be very typical of jinn. They're not formed completely right. They have weird things about their appearances that don't make sense, weird ways of talking and acting like they, they're uncomfortable in the physical world. But they seem to know a lot about 
contactees and abductees. They know where they live. They know their experiences. Uh, they know where to find them. And when contact is made between men in black and an experiencer, oftentimes a whole host of paranormal things start to happen, poltergeist effects, uh, nightmares, dream invasions, uh, mental oppression, uh, apparitions, uh, missing time, and uh, this seems to be part of the syndrome of harassment. You know, it's amazing. How did you get going into your research? I mean, I wouldn't even know where to start. You know, George, I didn't go, the odd thing is, I didn't go looking for this. It sort of found me, and I think it was research that really needed to be done. Uh, it's, it's, a lot of this started with shadow people. Now, I was familiar with Jin, and um, I've been uh, intrigued by them for a very long time when I was doing research in witchcraft, sorcery, Solomonic magic, and, and topics like that. I, I came across the Jin. Uh, and it was not until I got involved in shadow people out of my own curiosity. And, uh, um, you know, the audience prompts me. Uh, I get requests from people for help in certain situations. Um, I'll get a, a, a tidal wave of emails all related to the same sort of thing going on. And it, it prompts me to do deeper investigations. And then it was a matter of just following the leads. One thread led to another. I found that the deeper I went, the more complicated it got and the, the more lines of inquiry opened up that had to be examined. Well, are you enjoying this kind of research? I mean, did you come across anything that might have frightened you that you uh, want to tell us about? The whole scenario is disturbing, and, uh, you know, my work in the paranormal and metaphysical fields, uh, it's on both sides of the fence. Uh, I've dealt with uh, benevolent spirits and, and with spiritual enlightenment and growth and uh, contact with high-level entities who have a much different uh, approach toward human beings, a healing, uh, illuminating kind of approach, and, you know, Technically, well, isn't that where we'd all rather be with, with the good guys? Um, but the, the dark side of things goes on. There is a dark underbelly to it, and it needs to be examined. So uh, I, I do believe that this was a very purposeful part of my work and that in many respects I was being directed by my own uh, spirit guides to do this because nobody else was willing to look at it. You've looked at the Watchers. Explain that in the relationship to the jinn, Rosemary. The Watchers from the biblical story, uh, the sons of God, who uh, were set to, to with the task of watching over humanity, coveted human women, left their posts, cohabited and created the Nephilim, the, the monstrous cannibals. They were cannibals and vampires. They ate flesh and drank blood and spread corruption on the land. The Watchers are often described as angels, but really their behavior matches the jinn. And uh, this would be characteristic of the jinn to have some sort of like a, a boss or overseer role and uh, see what's, you know, hey, there's something in it for us, so uh, let's... let's uh, you know, leave our posts and indulge ourselves. This would be very characteristic of jinn behavior. And it was a deal-making sort of thing. And the jinn are famous for making deals in exchange for teaching human beings the forbidden arts. They, but don't they kind of renege on the deal? Um, well, jinn, uh, jinn will often uh, do their bit. They, they will um, make their end of the deal, but they also want human beings to make their end of the deal back. It's a two-way street. It's not, I'm going to do favors for you just because I'm Mr. Nice Guy. It's, right. You're going to have to do favors for me, too. One of the things that I argue in the Jin Connection is that we ought to re-examine a lot of our ancient alien, ancient god, uh, demigod, it, it encounters and experiences from the standpoint of jinn, because many of these beings and their behavior patterns are characteristic of jinn. So the jinn are salted in there throughout human history. S uh, scuttlers, what are they? 
the, the scuttlers are a modern term for these sounds like, shadow sounds like creatures, neighbors, and true. they look like uh, oily, oozy crabs. They're like shadow crabs. They were described to me by um, one of my uh, U.K. contacts, Miles Johnston, who had uh, worked in the broadcast um, profession for a good number of years and was involved in pirate radio stations um, during the the heavy conflicts between uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland. And these pirate radio stations would broadcast what they called intention-infused music across uh, the border into Northern Ireland. Uh, this would be a, a form of, of um, thought therapy, that we infuse our music with good intentions and peace and harmony, and uh, that this energy would be part of what would be received by the people listening to the music. Well, Miles discovered that um, you know, they would have these frequent equi- equipment breakdowns, and it seemed to center around the transmitter. So he would have to go inside the transmitter, and he got the shock of his life by opening up the equipment and seeing these, these forms inside, and they looked like uh, crabs, and, and they would scuttle out of the way as soon as he would see them and light would hit them, much the same way that shadow people will often disappear when people look at them. They don't want to be observed for very long periods of time. These entities seem to be intrinsically involved in the breakdown of equipment, stopping one of the peace efforts. He found out over the course of time that uh, scuttlers were in other places, too. They were, they were in England. People were seeing them, uh, were experiencing them. These beings had the capability of literally latching on to, um, to individuals and then causing certain kinds of health problems. This sounds like another form uh, of shadow people, which would be another form of jinn. Shadow people are often blobs or pillars. They're not uh, well-defined as, as human forms. Uh, I have seen them shape-shift in front of me from uh, a human-like form into uh, an amorphous blob of black into swirling black mist that just disappears. Uh, so uh, the scuttlers seem to be uh, a very uh, invasive form of, of this entity that gets into our electronic equipment. Huh. Sounds like... Uh... Nasty-looking uh, little creatures, huh? And how pervasive they are, uh, again, nobody knows. Nobody really knows. Uh, one of the things that I observed about shadow people was uh, I had a, a number of cases, a whole subset. Uh, there are the, like these satellite patterns around the core experience of the bedroom invasion. Well, one of the satellite uh, subsets were um, shadow people who seem to be intensely interested in telecommunications, um, hanging around people who were uh, taking apart um, salvage cell phone towers, uh, dissembling computers, working in electronics. And um, they seem to be watching and observing I like wanting to know uh, what what the innards were and and how things work. Well, shadow people seem to be very sensitive to electromagnetic energy and and uh, electrical fields. They're definitely and, from other dimensions, Rosemary, no doubt. Rosemary Ellen Guiley's research, the Jin Connection, and when we come back in a moment, she has written a book called The Encyclopedia of Dreams. We're going to talk about dreams. And welcome back, Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Uh, Rosemary, before we go to dreams, do you want to wrap up the gin connection for us, put it all in perspective? We need to be aware of who the gin are and how they're interacting with us and um, realize that we are sharing the planet with them. Uh, and that's the purpose of the gin connection, to educate people about how these entities are involved in so many of our encounters and experiences. 
They uh, are quite likely playing very active roles in uh, a lot of the upheaval going on on the planet. They can be um, conjured and, and used for those purposes as well. Well, you, you've done a remarkable job with this on the research, and uh, I, I hope you keep at it, Rosemary. Good job. Thank you. Good job. And, of course, dreams. You've always done a good job on dreams. What got you fascinated in dreams in the first place? Early experiences when I was a kid, uh, my mother had a lot of precognitive dreams, and I had some paranormal experiences when I was a kid, fairies and angels. Most children have some kind of paranormal experience. But the idea that you could dream the future and it would happen, you could, you could accurately dream the future, just astounded me when I was very young. And I wanted to know more. I wanted to learn about dreams. And uh, when I got into my teens, I started experimenting with my dreams. I uh, got uh, books like, um, uh, oh, Harold Sherman was one of my uh, mm-hmm. early tutors, uh, some of his work about how you can send dreams to people and how you travel in your dreams. I discovered that uh, dreaming in terms of our involvement in the spirit world goes back to ancient times. So dreams became a very important avenue of exploration of the spirit world for me, and I learned how to astral travel. I uh, never had the extent of precognitive dreaming that my mother did, which might have been a good thing because many of her dreams were about unhappy situations, Uh, but I did have other kinds of dreams, and um, I have realized how important they are in our daily life. They are a barometer of truth. They always reflect to us how we think we're doing in life, and they contain information to help us make decisions, make course corrections, um, restore balance in life. They also are avenues for our spiritual growth as well. So I've done six books now on dreams, understanding dreams. My, My newest one is called The Pocket Dream Guide and Dictionary, and uh, it's intended as, as a handbook to help people unravel the meaning of their dreams. Rosemary, is science studying dreams? I mean, I, you know, I know how they talk about, you know, they put electrodes up to people and things, but, I mean, are they really studying dreams to the point where one day we may be able to tap into the brain and actually see a dream as if we're watching a television show? Yes, some researchers are are doing that, uh, exploring the potential for dreams to open up doorways uh, to our untapped potential and to other other realities. The ancients knew that dreams were a gateway to the spirit realms, that they were places that didn't exist here on Earth, and they were kind of in-between. Plato called them the the in-between state, uh, where we could meet with... Uh, the dead, with uh, the gods and goddesses, so to speak. These experiences have continued in our dreaming life throughout history. So there are scientists who want to study the mechanisms of this, not just the the chemicals that are involved in the process of dreaming, but the, uh, the untapped spiritual potential and creative potential for using our dreams to... Um, maximize our intellectual powers, our creative powers, and very importantly, our healing powers. Well, there's no question that, you know, in the dream state, we can do some incredible things. I mean, we can solve problems. We can uh, do just about anything. Let's, let's talk about dreams and their various facets and what their strengths might be, Rosemary. Let's start, first of all, with precognitive dreams. What causes that? Some people do it, some people can't. Some people have a natural affinity for precognitive dreaming, and we don't adequately understand the mechanism why some people are inherently more psychic in many respects than other people. Now, for my mother, for example, had um, a variety of entity uh, contact experiences, and she was always very unsettled by this. It was difficult for her uh, to cope with it, even if experiences were positive. Uh, and she was born this way. Uh, my grandmother had some of that ability, too. And uh, it manifests in different ways. 
um, throughout families. For me, it was um, more entity contact through through clairvoyance and and uh, things like that. But I have had a lot of very unusual dreaming. Uh, so anyone can learn how to develop those aspects of their dreams to at least some extent. Uh, some people are very prolific lucid dreamers, but you can also learn how to become a lucid dreamer. The more attention you pay your dreams, the more they talk to you, the more information they give you, and the richer your dreaming life becomes. How do you know that this precognitive dream is indeed something, a glimpse into the future? Do you Should you record them? Should you write them down? And maybe if it happens, start paying a little bit more attention to them? Precognitive dreams always have a different signature than ordinary dreams, and it varies by individuals. Uh, we all seem to have our own litmus test for uh, periodic psychic dreaming. Some people will only have precognitive dreams a few times in their lifetimes, and other people will have them quite frequently. They learn over time by paying attention to their dreams, by recording them, uh, what the signals are that distinguish precognitive dreams. Let, let's take the example of an airplane crash. To dream of an airplane crash is not automatically precognitive. Um, it could be symbolic of something going on in your life, that something is crashing to earth. Um, you've been flying too high or you're flying in the wrong direction or, or something that you thought would fly isn't going to make it. There are a lot of ways to interpret something like that. But with the right set of, of conditions associated with that and also repeating dreams, uh, precognitive dreams will often repeat, uh, we, we learn to distinguish whether or not something is a harbinger of an event that's going to happen. Um, in one of my dream books, I have uh, the example of, um, I think it happened around 1980, 79 or 80. It was a DC-10 that took off from Chicago and uh, crashed on landing. An engine fell off, and uh, hundreds of people were killed. Well, there was a man who dreamed of this event almost every night for a couple of weeks before it happened, and he knew that he was seeing the future, that this was going to happen. The problem was he didn't know where, when, and what airline. And that's often the case with precognitive dreams. Right. We're missing key elements that help us um, determine exactly what's going to happen. How does it work? I mean, how in God's name, Rosemary, can someone, whether it's a remote viewer or a precognitive dreamer tap into the future when it hasn't even happened yet? Maybe it has. Uh, in, in the sense of uh, eternal time, it, it's already taken place. And in our reality, uh, these are forces in motion. Uh, there are circumstances, choices, all, all sorts of things that contribute to an event. They become forces in motion. And... Uh, Things can impact this. Uh, things can divert uh, forces in motion. They can magnify them. And events that take place, at some point, they reach a critical mass, just like an airplane taking off. It reaches a critical speed. It has to take off. Uh, so forces in motion reach a critical mass where the event actually then takes place in physical reality. Some people have the ability to tune into these forces in motion. Uh, now, a lot of times uh, when people have attempted to um, to do studies of precognitive dreams and, and even do things like premonitions bureau, like let's collect all our precognitive dreams to avert disasters, um, people might actually be dreaming of probable events that never make it because something intervenes before critical mass happens. Uh, that's my own theory on it, and uh, I see that pattern of activity in in, um, in studying the nature of precognitive dreams. Now, let's talk about lucid dreaming. Of course, a lucid dream is a dream where you know you're dreaming. So what's the significance of that? 
we don't understand the full value of lucid dreaming, which is knowing you're dreaming while you're dreaming. And uh, sometimes that's all you get is you suddenly realize that you're in a dream. Uh, other times uh, you have the ability to manipulate the dream, to decide what you're going to do. You're not just a passive player in your own dream, uh, as, as um, most people are most of the time. You are directing the dream. You decide where you're going to go, what you're going to do, if you're going to stop something, start something. Many researchers believe that this kind of dreaming has tremendous potential for um, tapping into creative and healing powers. And uh, these are the kinds of dreams that have been under intense study for um, you know, decades now in terms of can we, can we harness this energy? Can we teach ourselves how to lucidly dream? This may be a function, an evolutionary function, that more and more humans are going to literally be born into. Uh, I have met individuals who are prolific lucid dreamers. I mean, every night they are capable of having lucid dreams, and yet other people might only have them every now and then. Now, with these dreams, these lucid dreams, um, the fact that you're in a dream and you can and you know you're dreaming, and if you can control the outcome of the dream, how does that affect you in your real life, or does it? It may um, help us harness our powers of intuition for making decisions. A dream seem to tap into a very deep level of our our awareness, uh, the higher self, which uh, is is like a a radar sweep that's uh, constantly looking out into the timescape uh, for events that are shaping up, for decisions that we're going to have to make. And lucid dreaming seems to tap into that particular sweep of the timescape. So if we learn how to lucid dream, uh, perhaps we are then better in touch with our intuition. We can make better decisions for ourselves. Um, we can get in touch with our spiritual guidance, which manifests to different people in different ways, sometimes through the personalities of spirit guides and uh, other times through um, being more in touch with our, with our higher self, with our own deep intuition. What do you call the dreams, Rosemary, that allow you to accomplish goals and objectives? Is there any specific name for it? Those are commonly called dream incubation or dream programming. And uh, these are techniques that have been employed since ancient times to really put dreams to work for us. Before we go to sleep, we can instruct our dreaming mind to address a question, to give us um, give us the answer to uh, a decision that we need to make, to point us in the right direction, to reveal a solution, uh, to help us find a way to heal something in our lives, whether it's a physical illness or uh, a life that's been, you know, shredded by um, bad, uh, you know, disasters Decisions. and, and uh, bad luck. Night terrors. Uh, night terrors um, take a variety of forms, uh, disturbing dreams, nightmarish dreams to people where in some cases they might be pursued by dark forms, by dark people, uh, and sometimes these dreams repeat, and uh, they, they often contain the, the start of a profound healing process. Uh, sometimes Disturbing dreams are related to uh, medical conditions, to psychological states, you know, stress disorders and things like that. Sometimes they contain the, uh, the start of a healing process, and they're disturbing because the dreaming self really needs to get our attention to address something that's way out of balance. Are the night terrors tied into sleep paralysis or that old hag syndrome, Rosemary? Yes, and, and it is possible for entities to interact uh, with our dreams as well. And uh, there are types of night terror dreams in, in which we are paralyzed. Uh, we, we sort of wake up into a limbo state where we're uh, not fully awake, but we're not 
asleep either, and, and we are unable to move. Uh, while there is something, some horrible presence in the room. Now, we do go through natural states of paralysis while we're uh, asleep and dreaming, but those particular kinds of dreams are related to disturbing entity visitations. I've come across those conditions in shadow people visits, in um, other kinds of, you know, demonic sorts of cases where people are, uh, being oppressed by um, a malevolent spirit. Uh, sometimes people can actually employ dreams as, as curses uh, to, to send entities to invade us while we're vulnerable during sleep to uh, cause nightmarish situations. So dream invasion is uh, a, a real kind of dream, and uh, sometimes we have dream invasions just by sleeping in energy negatively energetic places, haunted locations, and uh, other times there are entities that have somehow zeroed in on us and are in the process of um, uh, manipulating us in some way. A dream that you're falling, is, what does that mean? Your career's over? You're dying? What is that? It's one of the most common kinds of dreams, falling. And it's often an anxiety dream that we have when we're going through uh, difficult times in life where uh, these dreams are often related to uh, times when we feel we're just not in control of things. And it's, it's often a horrible feeling in a dream to be in a free fall. There's a bit of folklore that holds that if you, if you hit bottom in your dream, it means you're going to die. But um, this is more uh, just a superstition than anything else. Plenty of people hit bottom in a falling dream and uh, they, they get a, a shock or a jolt, um, but uh, it, it's not a harbinger of, of doom by any means. But um, if someone has repeated falling dreams, um, e- examine what's going on in your life where you're feeling out of control. It could be at work, it could be at a relationship, it could be yeah. literally being at sea over uh, making a major decision about something. Uh, so I had a dream that people kept coming into my house that I didn't know, and they never would leave. And they kept coming and coming and coming. I even called 911. The cops never came. It was one of the most frustrating dreams I've ever had, Rosemary. W- what would you say about something like that? If, if that were my dream, uh, I would look at it in terms of... Uh, my space and my time being invaded by things I can't control. And that's what these, these unknown people are. They're invading my home, uh, which is symbolic of one's environment where uh, we're supposed to have total control over our home. Right. Um, outside forces, the cops who are, are being called, outside forces have no impact on this. So the dream would be telling me that, no one's going to help me get a handle on, on something that, um, that I need to, to get control of. Other people are impacting me in ways it could be uh, time invasions, um, people asking me to do things that uh, are not in, not in my best interest, but, but taking up my space. All right, Rosemary, uh, let's uh, come back in just a moment. We'll continue talking about the dream state I want to ask you about when two people separately have about the same dream, they're sharing the same dream. How does that happen? More to come with Rosemary Ellen Guiley on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back. Rosemary Ellen Guiley with us as we're talking about dreams and the gin connection as well, which is a spooky, spooky thing. I. You, I, I do have to ask you about a dream, and then I want to bounce back and forth a little bit this half hour, Rosemary, between sure. these two subjects. But if somebody dreams of someone else, and that other person dreams of that person, what is that? How are they doing that? It's called mutual dreaming or shared dreaming, and it seems to be a natural function of dreaming. It's probably more prevalent than we realize because most of the time we don't discuss our dreams with other people. But in some cultures, shared dreaming is not only uh, common, it's expected that if you're connected to someone in an intimate way or you're part of a family 
uh, or a, a culture, a society, you would share the dreamscape with them the same way you would share the daily life environment. So sometimes we have shared dreams uh, just as um, a demonstration of this connection. Uh, a shared dream could be the exact dream. It could have uh, the same theme or the same elements. Sometimes shared dreams are just two people dreaming of each other on the same night uh, in similar circumstances. And there, there may be uh, elements of lucidity to it, too. Um, just like lucid dreams, shared dreams seem to be an advanced dreaming power that is probably part of our spiritual evolutionary track. We're going to have more and more of this as we evolve our consciousness. Rosemary, if someone has such a horrible dream, frightening dream, could they die of a heart attack in their sleep? Uh, you know, George, I don't know, but I, I have heard um, stories of people who have awakened uh, in absolute terror from dreams with the heart pounding, uh, and technically, is it possible to be scared to death? Yes, it is. Uh, these sorts of things do happen. I mean, how do, we, how do we know, for example, that some of these many cases of heart attacks in one sleep aren't caused by something like that? We just don't know. Well, they, some of them might very well be, and in fact, from a magical perspective, if if you were attempting to uh, to do something detrimental to a person through their dreams, that would be one avenue that you would send them uh, a, a horrifying dream uh, or an entity that would be able to physically attack them and harm them uh, during their sleep. Uh, these sorts of of concepts do exist in the magical literature. Well, they, they sure do. Now back to the gin for a little bit. Uh, you also talk about a connection with reptilians, so explain that a little bit more. The reptilian is a, um, a, a common presence in the ET abduction scenario, and then we also have uh, a lot of uh, beliefs about reptilian races who live in uh, underneath the earth, uh, some of them are said to be extraterrestrial. Um, we have uh, creation stories about reptilian uh, entities emerging from the earth to to populate the planet. Reptilians are involved in the fall of human beings, uh, the serpent, uh, and the story of Adam and Eve. And uh, the snake and reptile form are the most common form taken by the jinn. Uh, and so there's an interesting... A connection there, again, linking the jinn to the ET abduction phenomenon. Uh, conspiracy theories also get much deeper into the reptilian forms as well, that they're tied in with um, Illuminati and world conspiracy uh, organizations. Uh, some people believe that the, the reptilians are uh, actually beneficial, that um, are benevolent. Here, here again, I don't think we can categorize any entity as all one disposition or the other, all good or all bad. Um, I have interviewed people who've had terrifying encounters with humanoid reptilian beings, and I've interviewed people who've had encounters with reptilians that I feel that they feel are here to uh, to mingle among us, to be of help to us, to help us come into our full fruition of of powers and creativity. Well, you know, the, the research that you've done into this is, is fantastic. It really is. Um, are you concerned that you might have conjured any of these up to come and get you? I have had uh, encounters with unpleasant entities that are directly connected to my research. And, yes, once, once you get on the radar... You never get off. Um, and I have attracted the attention of beings who really do not want a whole lot of information about them out there. Uh, I have not been harassed to a large extent, knock on wood. I feel I have a lot of spiritual protection around me. I also have a very healthy respect for these entities. Uh, and 
I am attempting to understand them and uh, their perspectives and their motives from their point of view uh, as they engage with human beings. Uh, so I don't automatically consider them uh, to be evil. There might be hostile ones, but that doesn't make them necessarily evil. So do I have uh, troubling encounters? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I have from time to time had bedroom invasions by shadow people. Um, I've had um, unpleasant things happen in my life that um, one would attribute to spirit interference. And sometimes it's it's difficult to make the call on that. But when a spate of things happen happens, um, a spate of things happen that uh, follow uh, a time when I've been doing a lot of intensive research, uh, it's hard to ignore those connections. Uh, sometimes when I've undertaken investigations of, of cases, uh, I've had interference uh, that seems to be for the purpose of blocking the investigation. Things happen to people to, um, to stop things, to cause things to be planned again. I've had um, a few physical marks on the body that seem to be um, oh, retribution, you know, scratches and um, a bleeding cut or two. Uh, and it, it just sort of goes with the territory. Uh, there are times when hmm. I feel it's not prudent for, uh, for me to go into a, a particular area, so to speak, of a line of inquiry. I need to back off for a while. And uh, you, you have to learn, um, you know, when, when it's time to hold them and when it's time to fold them. <laughs> I find it fascinating, though, that you believe that the jinn are responsible for most of these kinds of activities that we've had on this planet. The evidence points in that direction. And once I started factoring the gin into a lot of equations, even uh, haunting investigations, a lot of things started making sense. And uh, so, of course, I went out and consulted a lot of my colleagues in the field. Have you come across this? What is your explanation? Have you considered? And uh, they were coming up against the same thing, like uh, hauntings that, uh, involved a lot of um, very detrimental effects on people. Um, their health would be affected, mental uh, oppression as well. Uh, cases would not resolve. Shadow people were often a, a key component of that. And a lot of times a whole multitude of forms would be uh, assaulting people. Uh, and I believe that the, the uh, gin can account for them all. Uh, I've had cases where... I think a single gin has accounted for a dozen or more manifestations, uh, all of which were aimed at tormenting and, and harassing people. Um, so got- factoring the gin in suddenly made sense in a, in a lot of cases that defied explanation and defied resolution. And then following these other trails, uh, into the other areas of the cryptids, the abduction uh, scenarios, uh, people with missing time, missing people. Uh, missing people, uh, some of these individuals might be uh, persons who fall through interdimensional doorways and don't make it back, or they get kidnapped yeah. by entities and don't make it back. You've got a segment on David Jacobs who believes that uh, ET visitations are not very benevolent at all. Tell me what you uh, uncovered there. Well, I do agree with uh, David Jacobs that the abduction scenario is, is detrimental to human beings. And sure. in the Jin Connection, um, I uh, comment on the works of other researchers uh, and ways in which the Jin have showed up in the documentation that they've accumulated. And uh, in so doing, I, I do make the point that I'm not saying that their own interpretations are right or wrong, just that I see evidence for the jinn in the testimonies and documentation they've done, and um, this needs to be brought into a better light. But um, here again, we find many similarities between the jinn and the kinds of things that David Jacobs has discovered 
like uh, the hybrid program, gin uh, entities, uh, which could be gin that attach to people for life. They're like uh, companions that uh, attach to a person early in life and age along with them and, and then become involved in uh, a deeper relationship with them and also the abduction scenario. And that um, these sorts of activities uh, are for a purpose of infiltration. Uh, and we don't always know exactly what they're up to and why, but why would you infiltrate a population? You would want to subjugate them. You'd want to take them over. Perhaps you'd want to eliminate them. So the evidence is there, uh, and researchers have dug it out uh, for the ETs, and we also need to realize that the jinn are among the entities who are participating in this. All right, let's go to the phones east of the Rockies, Lawrence in Dallas, Texas. Hi, Lawrence, go ahead. Hi. It's a uh, great show tonight. My brain is on fire again. <laughs> Good. Um, this subject is really interesting, and uh, what I'll say is that I've had some strange personal experiences. I had a very oppressive dream a couple of times, and... Uh, I've come to believe that uh, the jinn and the archons uh, are similar, if not the same, and that they're parasitical, essentially, on the human race just to get, uh, you know, bad reactions from them, etc. Uh, and I believe that, uh, that they're uh, constantly, as you say, infiltrating and wishing to oppress. But I, I want to say that I think that the greatest... Um, defense against them is to be able to discern when you have a thought in your mind that is not your own and then be able to say well that's not my that's not really something that I would normally think of and then sort of segregate that and and realize that maybe something is trying to get you to do something that you wouldn't normally do what do you think of that rosemary that's very good advice uh Entities do have the capability of invading our thoughts and manipulating thoughts, and uh, sometimes we're, we're not very aware of that. I do have uh, a chapter in the book where I discuss the archons and uh, how well they fit the Jinn template, um, and uh, that many of these beings that we've engaged with throughout our history uh, can be reinterpreted as Jinn. Uh, they have the traits and characteristics the Archons do, the Nephilim, the Watchers, the Anunnaki. Uh, many of the uh, gods, uh, the early gods who had hybrid forms, uh, could be jinn. And this points to a very significant involvement of uh, a manipulative entity who's been part of our development from the very beginning. So, yes, self-awareness, uh, being um, master of your, your own thoughts, uh, your consciousness, um, pursuing a, a path of um, meditation and, and spiritual growth, very important to our autonomy. At the end of the Jin Connection, I have a chapter called um, the, the Battle for Humanity, which is, you know, how, how do we combat these sorts of things? And some of the... the um, protection measures are taken from the ET abduction community, and Druffle was uh, very good at um, interviewing people about what worked for them, and I've interviewed gin contactees as well. And some of the things that work the best in the long run are not Band-Aid kind of uh, uh, treatments, but what we call up from within ourselves our own spiritual strength, our own sense of autonomy, uh, right, what, what Druffel calls righteous anger, and I've used that myself uh, in repelling unwanted presences, righteous anger, sovereignty, recognizing that we have sovereignty uh, and we have the right to autonomy, and uh, because other beings who seem to be more powerful than us uh, attempt to manipulate us does, does not mean we should uh, give over our... Uh, authority and power to them. So there is a lot of self-awareness in in this kind of approach, and that's really what's going to make the big difference in the long run. Rosemary, uh, with all these uh, potential problems with the, the gin, um, 
you would think we'd find a way to repel them. We haven't, have we? Have we? There are many ways that are very effective for repelling them, but the problem is none of them work in 100% of the cases 100% of the time. Uh, we're dealing with very clever entities of different motivations, different uh, power uh, abilities, and, of course, human beings vary quite a bit in their ability to combat something as well. So a remedy that works very well for one person may not work at all for another. Uh, there are um, simple remedies, like with shadow people, they're uh, often affected by uh, the EMF and, and electrical energy and, envi- and environment, leaving lights on, computers, mm-hmm. televisions, can interfere with their ability to, to manifest. Uh, people what? have used all kinds of religious invocations and prayers. Uh, all, all religions have ways of dealing with unwanted spirit presences. They're all effective, but they're not effective in all cases. Oftentimes we have to experiment to find something. Now when we use religious remedies, we're also calling up our own spiritual strength, and that's very important as well. Uh, When we ask for uh, help of of God or religious figures, um, we are connecting with them in a uh, a very deep way, and that helps us bring up our own defenses, too. Let's see if we can get Daniel in here, truck driving in Iowa, first-time caller. Go ahead, Dan. Hi, I just have a question. Um, sure. I used to have a a recurring dream about uh, there being, like, a nuclear attack, and, and as I'm basically dying, uh, I'm watching my family die and everything else, but I went through a divorce, and I hadn't had this dream for several years, and then all of a sudden it just popped up. Oh, it's bad. But uh, I've been reading this book, Invitation to Dream, to overcome it, but I can't seem to get past it. And the thing that's different about it is I'm in a new relationship. The people have changed. I just wonder if you could give me an idea of what's, you know, or right, what I let's can do or... Hold, that, hold that thought, Rosemary, because I want you to answer it when we come back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. Okay, this hour we'll take your phone calls with Rosemary Ellen Guiley. We will come right back on Coast to Coast AM. Um. And welcome back. Uh, Rosemary, okay, so Daniel, truck driving in Iowa, had a dream of nukes. Uh, he, he couldn't do anything. His family was in trouble. Everybody was in trouble. The dream went away, and now it's back again, and he claims he's got a new relationship. What's happening to the guy? Well, one possibility is that the dream might be an anxiety trigger. Uh, dreams of total disaster where life is just torn apart and people die, uh, sometimes you you think you're going to die in the dream, too. Uh, these often accompany major upheavals in life. And Daniel did say that he was going through a divorce while he was having this recurring dream of nuclear attack and death. Um, recurring dreams are part of this syndrome of um, upheaval in life, and oftentimes they stop when the problem is resolved, when you get past the the emotional trauma of it. But um, if this were my dream, and I stress that um, individuals such as myself, we can help somebody understand their dreams, but only the dreamer can truly arrive at at the meaning of the dream. Uh, this dream might become have become a symbol for anxiety over. Uh, whether or not a relationship is going to survive. If the divorce was particularly traumatic and a, a new relationship uh, starts, there could be some sort of fear, anxiety going on in the background, like um, how, you know, how much am I going to get involved? Is it all going to blow up on me? Uh, those, sorts of, those sorts of things. So that would, if, if that were my dream, that would be my approach to examine my, my deepest and truest feelings about what's going on uh, with the engagement in the new relationship. 
Okay, to the phones we go. Let's go to Sarah in Longmont, Colorado. Hello, Sarah. Go ahead. Um, hi. Can you hear me? Yep. We sure can. Thank you. So I have, since I was very, very young, had precognitive dreams. Um, although they never seem to be about anything important. <laughs> They're always about, like, you know, somebody frying an egg at breakfast or, you know, oh, I see this scene from a movie, like, four months before it comes out. And it's just really dumb stuff. But I've been trying to figure out if there's some way to maybe control them um, to where maybe they can help either myself or my family um, you know, where I could see more, maybe more important things coming up rather than just some scene from a movie or, you know what I mean? Um, so do you have any methods for things like that? Um, one of the thought I only had was to try lucid dreaming, but so far that hasn't worked out for me. <laughs> Uh, sometimes it is difficult for people to learn how to lucid dream. The ability varies considerably. But actually, you are having important dreams. Uh, I call them little precognitions. And uh, the ability to even perceive in advance small things in life is very significant and could very well open the door to uh, to what you would consider to be more important things that you would like to know about. So paying attention to your dreams is number one, to write them down. And when you have these precognitive dreams, uh, learn how how to recognize their signatures. They come with certain emotional tones, certain images, certain feelings. Track the time that uh, it takes for something to manifest. And pay a special attention. Excuse me. Poor Rosemary, losing voice. <laughs> Talking too much. Um, <clears throat> go ahead. You want to go get a glass of water um, while I... Uh... I've, I've got some water here, George. All right, go yeah. ahead. Take a little gulp and uh, <clears throat> do what you've got to do. And it's yeah, always a... Special attention to um, body feelings and emotional tones when you connect with the actual event that you saw in your dream. And these are all part of the way your higher self gives you intuitive information about everything going on in life. So when you start to recognize these sorts of of signals, then um, when you're confronted with uh, decisions you have to make or trying to look into the future to anticipate uh, things that, uh, how things are going to work out, uh, you may recognize some of those uh, same responses of emotions, thoughts, images, and uh, uh, body feelings as well. So that's one approach that I would try. And uh, you may see over a period of time uh, that your dreams are more responsive in terms of giving you information that you would consider more helpful. (laughs) Okay, I can try that. Thank you. All right, there you go. Next up, we go to Beth in Austin, Texas. Hey, Beth, take it away. Uh, hi, George. Hi, um, Rosemary. Can you oh, hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Um, my question, I'm, I'm trying to condense it, is, uh, Rosemary, from the, from the things you uh, said about the gin earlier and the, your own experiences that you recounted and how you could tell it was the gin, I still didn't really hear something specific enough for me to understand how you know it, if it's a gin or a ghost or an alien abduction or just bad luck or um, just a telling, um, you know, really understanding why, why is it that, oh, well, that is a gin. Um, can you, be, can you uh, provide some more specific, specific on that? Sometimes it's by a process of elimination. Uh, when, when we go to investigate a case, whether it's a negative haunting or recurring entity contact or abduction experiences, um, you don't always know what you're dealing with right off the bat. You have to gather a lot of information. Um, sometimes people have um, lifelong experiences that fall into certain patterns. And those can be compared to patterns in certain types of entity cases. So, um, 
Um, and even so, in many times, we as researchers and investigators often give something our best interpretation based on, on what we know. Uh, and when you're dealing with entities that have the ability to disguise themselves and to make you think there's something else, uh, it may take a while to sort out. But things that I look for, <clears throat> uh, there are, when people have recurring uh, troubling experiences and abduction experiences, there are lifelong patterns for many of these people. Certain kinds of experiences start early in life. As I mentioned earlier, shadow people are often very prominent in those experiences. Um, multiple forms of entity manifestations and negative hauntings, uh, all of which are aimed at uh, the same objective to harass people. Um, if I... if cases do not resolve, they are frequently gin if they resist um, various remedies. Are you convinced, Rosemary, that shadow people are jinn? I am indeed. I'm firmly convinced of that. <clears throat> the, um, the modus operandi of shadow people is very well suited to jinn. The jinn are the hidden ones, and shadow people are hidden entities. They are not in their true form. There's nothing human about them. Uh, they watch, they observe, they manipulate, sometimes they attack. When they attack, people feel vampirized. They feel uh, their life force has been weakened or taken in some way. Uh, the entities can interfere with their lives in uh, certain ways, in their relationships, um, health issues. And uh, this is a, a pattern uh, of characteristics and behavior that is very strongly identified with gin. Uh, and when I was studying shadow people, I went through a considerable process of elimination to try and understand what these entities were. Uh, they, they did not behave like ghosts. Um, they did not behave, um, even though they seemed demonic, they did not behave like demons because many of them just watch and observe, um, and they don't, they don't do a progressive spiritual takeover. Um, they're capable of invading dreams, but they weren't just like a nightmare hag either. They are associated with poltergeist effects, but they're not just a poltergeist. And so on and on, I went through a pro process of elimination, and the only thing that fit all of those categories were the gin. Well, process of elimination, huh? So uh, if evidence comes along that indicates that shadow people may be something else or may involve things other than gin, I'm entirely open to it. I think it's very important to be open-minded in research. And uh, I've had to revise my uh, views a number of times because of the evidence I've come across. But uh, so far I have not come across anything that, uh, indicates that shadow people are other than gin. All right, next up we go to Gary in uh, Carteret, New Jersey. Hey, good morning, Gary. Go ahead. Hey, uh, great show, George. Um, I have a question um, concerning the gin and possibly like a Sasquatch because from what I understand, some people run into a Sasquatch and it's just a higher... Uh, primate, and it's just like seeing another wild animal. And then some people mm. run into a Sasquatch, and they get a dr sense of dread or menace from it. Is there a possibility that a djinn could, uh, instead of trying to get to a human, maybe get into a higher primate? Oh, well, yes, they could, although... I consider uh, the Sasquatch entity to be uh, from a parallel dimension. I do not consider them to be um, Earth-originated uh, primates. Um, I think they are, are uh, entities who live in a parallel dimension, and we find, find them frequently in ours. Uh, and, yes, Jin could certainly take that form. Uh, our mysterious creature contacts, including Sasquatch, 
would be well suited to gin behavior, gin motives, and, and gin agenda. Uh, here again, we, we run into this question of, well, where does one stop and the other start? Are, are all of these things gin or are gin mixing in among them? My opinion at this stage in my research is the gin mix in among them, that uh, they know these other entities exist and that we're interested in them and have contact with them, and they assume those forms when it suits their purpose to pass themselves off. Well, that could very well be. We go to Amber now in Livermore, California. Amber, you're on with Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Go ahead. Hi. Can you hear, am I coming through okay? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask your guest about... Um, these uh, reoccurring dreams that I've had, um, I mean, I've, I've had some precognitive dreams before, and I'm, I think I'm pretty sensitive to um, that sort of thing, and being able to interpret what uh, certain symbols mean as far as, like, how I feel and what's going on. Mm-hmm. But what's bothering me is this, um, this, buzzing, this buzzing thing that has been happening since I was a little girl. Um, it's like... Um, it, I feel it all the way through my body, and um, I can I can see it and hear it. And I've had a couple people tell me what they think it is. Um, one lady was a very religious lady who was interested in dreams, and she scared the crap out of me because I was about 15 years old, and she told me that they were um, bad spirits trying to attack me, and then. A few years ago, uh, another person had told me that it might be the beginning of an uh, out-of-body experience. And um, so I go through periods of time where I don't have them. And so the last one I had was just a couple of months ago, and I treated it like a possible out-of-body experience because I've never had that before. And um, so I, I tried to sit up, and I actually did see myself sleeping, but it could have been my imagination. Um, but, okay, but uh, I, I, I don't... Amber, what's, what's your question, though? My question is, um, what is that? Is it OBE, or is it bad spirits, or... Um, I, I don't know. When um, something like this occurs uh, during sleep and dreaming, it's um, usually associated with the onset of uh, OBE. We do go out of body uh, when we uh, sleep, and sometimes when people are in the early stages of lucid dreaming, they will get a buzzing sensation throughout the body, tingling, an electrical vibration. I've had that happen myself, uh, where I become aware of this incredible vibrating in my body, and it's before the onset of lucid dreaming, which um, I do believe takes takes place in an out-of-body kind of experience. So that may be what's going on. Well, you know, in most OBEs, you have that jarring effect, but not really a buzzing effect, Rosemary, right? Well, buzzing does occur. Um, People hear a buzzing sound in their ears. Um, They may vibrate. Um, In entity contact experiences, uh, sometimes the buzzing, roaring, uh, clicking, humming uh, sounds are um, associated with the uh, the arrival of an entity, and I think that this is a phenomenon of uh, an interdimensional shift going on, where we have an opening occurring, and this is one of the the phenomena of that. We've got Cody, first time caller, St. Cloud, Minnesota. Hey, Cody, go ahead. Thanks. Hey, George. Thanks for having me on the show. Long time sure listener. My um, uh, great show tonight, by the way. Um, I've spent my whole life um, experiencing a wide range of uh, experiences, anything from uh, UFO sightings to seeing shadow people to um, paranormal experiences. Um, I recently was uh, informed by my mother that she had um, a reoccurring dream that would change from time to time while she was pregnant with me, where she would be abducted and brought into a ship. And... Um, you know, uh, just checked up on, you know, you know, how's the pregnancy, that sort of thing. Um, I started uh, looking into the into Jin a few months back and uh, was beginning to maybe wonder if a uh, Jin could um, 
attach itself to not just an individual but an entire bloodline? Uh, yes, there is precedence for that where uh, they are attached to generational lines. And sometimes people make deals uh, with the jinn, and these deals go cut across uh, generational lines. And sometimes they take interest in people for uh, reasons that are obscure to us, um, and they they track people. Uh, and we we find this pattern in the ET abduction scenario as well, where entire bloodlines. Uh, are involved. It's also a prominent feature in the shadow person experience where um, families report being followed by an entity, no matter where they live. Members of the same family encounter this this figure. So uh, that is a characteristic. How many jinn are out there? What do you think? It's hard to say, George. It's sort of like asking how many angels are there. Uh, we don't really know. Um, I, I would guess that they have quite an extensive population and society in, in their own realm. Well, they very well could be. Rosemary, the book, of course, The Gin Connection, where do you get it? It's available on Amazon in hard print and as an ebook on Kindle and also on my website, visionaryliving.com, and I do send those out autographed. And, of course, the gin is spelled D-J-I-N-N. It's a silent D. Right. That's uh, one of the uh, the spellings. It's also westernized as J-I-N-N. And I'd also like to mention my website, uh, ginuniverse.com. You can also get the book there. Uh, I set up Gin Uni- Universe. Okay, we're going to edu- we'll, we'll, hold on for a second, Rosemary. We'll hit the break. We'll be- And welcome back. Rosemary Ellen Guiley with us. Your phone calls, and we'll go straight to them because we don't have a lot of time. Ray in McAllen, Texas, on our Skype line. Hey, Raymond, go ahead. Hey, how you doing, George? Okay, Great Ray. show. Big fan. Thank you. How sir. you doing, Rosemary? Fine, thanks, Ray. Okay. Uh, well, the reason I'm calling is because I've, uh, I've had dreams where I'm able to change them. Uh, for example, when I was younger, I had a dream where I walk into a house, and there's a shooter inside the house, and uh, I hide behind a chair, and, of course, I get shot because the bullets go through the chair. And then uh, later on in the years, I have the same dream, and I walk into the house, and I remember it, and I don't hide behind the chair. I go somewhere else where I don't get shot. I don't know what kind of dream, what it means, or, you know, if there's any explanation for it. Uh, dreams in which we're attacked by uh, invaders uh, are often related to something invading our life that's harmful to us. And so to be able to change that dream is um, uh, part of your ability to, to get on top of a situation, to not be harmed by something that's coming at you. In other words, something can be averted before it gets to the point of, of harm. And in the dream, it's, it's a physical harm, but that could be symbolic of anything going on in life. So it's important to relate dreams to what's going on in daily life. Uh, is there a situation going on uh, in which we feel we might be in danger in some way or something is not in our best interest? Uh, dreams monitor our emotions, and they feed back to us how we feel emotionally about situations. So see if anything like that applies to this sort of scenario. Rosemary, we were talking about your ginuniverse.com website that you opened up with this book. Tell us a little more about it. Uh, it's an educational site about the gin, and it includes hundreds of testimonials from people all over the world about their own gin experiences and, of course, a chance for people to express their views on the gin. I highly recommend it. It's a real eye-opener if you're unfamiliar with the gin. And then one other thing I wanted to mention is my new dream page on visionary living. Um, you know, dream interpretation is so important and also so popular. Uh, I've just set up a new page to help people interpret their own dreams. And it's got um, some questions and answers about the most common kinds of dreams and what they could possibly mean. And 
a format for interpreting your, your own dreams so that you can apply the benefit of them to daily life. And that's at visionaryliving.com. That sounds good. That, and how easy it is, is it to interpret your own dreams? It's surprisingly easy. At first, dreams seem very mysterious because they speak in symbols and they seem bizarre, stories without a middle or an end, and uh, they in- involve bits and pieces of daily life. But once you understand how they speak symbolically and how they relate to emotions, uh, the more you uh, pay attention to dreams, the easier it is to understand them. All right, next up, we go to Savant in Warrensburg, Missouri. Hello there, Savant. How you doing tonight, George? Good, Good listening to the program, and I appreciate the information that's uh, coming out. I've, I've got a question and uh, a comment, and I'd kind of like to preface the fact that in, in the conversation, it's been mentioned that the gen uh, like to be around electronic equipment, computers, people that repair them, whatever. I've been in uh, computer science, and I've done about 40 years of research on this, and, and what I have come to the conclusion is, and would like to ask the question, are you aware of the fact that through all of the um, World Wide Web, the data centers, the frequencies from cell phones, from Wi-Fi, it is actually opening up our atmosphere through portals to allow these fallen angels, jinn, spirits, whatever you want to call them, to come into the earth. I know mm-hmm. there was a comment made that they're gradually trickling in. But right now, as we're getting closer to um, the end times or realization or the awakening, they're starting to pour in, and these frequencies are actually, actually influencing the thought of mankind because our brains work on specific frequencies that are interrupted by all these frequencies from all the electronics. What I've found is that there is a a mathematical formula that exists uh, that in the science of putting all this uh, frequency together, there is a point of synchronization to where it is basically opening up these portals to let these spirits come in. An example of it is is the Tibetan monks that use kind of a... uh, a drone sound when they uh, go through their meditations that brings in these um, spirits of knowledge. Are are you familiar with this pattern at all? Uh, I'm not familiar with the specific formula that you might be uh, referencing, but I do agree that uh, all of these electronic advancements uh, are affecting um, frequencies of sound and vibration that are contributing to the opening up of portals. And this is one reason why we are seeing an increase in entity contact experiences across the board, and especially with uh, the problematic ones. Uh, Interestingly, um, frequent experiencers, uh, some of them have experimented with sound as a defense and with generating certain tones and sounds within the body, within the mind, uh, is even effective as uh, a way of pushing things away. So uh, this is yet another area where we need to be much more aware of the uh, the things that are affecting our uh, our environment, our own energy field, and the ability of other beings to approach us and interact with us. How do we close that portal? Some of them are very difficult to close. And, and let's face it, we are permanently in an in electronic uh, age here uh, where all of this technology is not going to go away. But we need to, to be aware of how it is impacting us and um, how it can affect our thoughts, our emotions, even uh, our, our physical health. So um, these are things that bear investigating, and if there are, there are certain tones and uh, formulae that, that can be applied to uh, improve our barriers, uh, we should uh, look more closely at these. Let's go to Fair Oaks, California. Rachel's turn, wild card line. Hey, Rachel, go ahead. Hi, George. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you again. Thanks. Hey, Rosemary. Um, Good evening. Uh, it's very fascinating to talk to you. I've always been uh, completely uh, fascinated by dreams. Um, I wanted to ask you your interpretation of one that I had. Um, it was about 20 years ago, but it was very vivid, and it's always kind of stuck with me. And anybody I've asked has uh, never been able to really tell me what they think it means. All right. Um, it, Fire away. It was, 
Okay, it was about 20 years ago, and uh, at that time I was young and just married. And the dream, I was uh, with my new husband, and um, it was apparent that he was, uh, I had never said it outright, but he was, you know, basically giving up his soul. And I was begging him not to do it, that he was being deceived, don't do it. And as morning came, he went outside, and it was uh, really cloudy, and there was these boiling green clouds in the sky, very low. And from out of the clouds, um, there was it opened kind of like a trap door, and a big green dragon flew out. It hovered over my um, husband at the time, and then it spit out this green fire, this big stream of green fire hit him. He crumpled to the ground. I was screaming no. And then it went and noticed me and hovered over me, and it spit the green fire out, but I held out my hand, the palm of my hand, like as in a stop, and the fire bounced off the palm of my hand and went back up and didn't hurt me at all. And then the dragon went back up into the clouds. And I was wondering what your take on that is. Wow, that's a different one, Rosemary. Yeah, a lot going on in that dream. One thing we, we need to do with dreams is relate all elements in them to ourselves, including other people. Uh, so even though, you know, you've got a lot of em- emotions going on with uh, a new relationship, um, the, the husband figure should be examined as an expression of oneself as well. And uh, there are a lot of associations with dragons. Uh, they're an intense fire energy, and fire uh, purifies and it heals, and green is associated with the color of, of healing. So it, if I have this dream, it seems like this, this green dragon is infusing me with a healing energy. Uh, perhaps something about the relationship is going to be very healing for, uh, for one or both of us. And um, I would start with those associations and see where they lead me in terms of, uh, you know, what all happened with the relationship. Uh, to me, it doesn't sound like a, a problematic dream. It sounds uh, like it, it has a lot of good auspices to it. All right. Thanks, Rachel. Hope that helped you. We uh, go next to Josie in Richmond, Virginia. Welcome to the show, Josie. Hello, George. Uh, hi, Rosemary. I have a dream, and I also tend to dream on the full moon period or the new moon period. I don't know if I'm the only one. I am a full moon child. It's when I was born. It was uh, Scorpio, Taurus, exact opposition. But I wondered about my dream because I I'm, I'm, I have no desire to go to Israel. Uh, we're coming up on the 40th, 46th anniversary of the attack on the liberty by Israel. And I I thought, I don't know why this would have anything to do with Israel necessarily, but that's where this dream took place. Um, even though I wasn't normally would go there, I was with some traveling companions. We were in a sort of little, um, sort of enclosed porch. It had long rectangular windows. You could look out and see a beach, not, not too crowded, uh, not white sand like beautiful beaches, but not bad. And, you know, some water. I don't know if it was lake uh, or if it was an ocean or a sea. And um, we were sitting around, and it came. We were at, um, finding, getting it settled. We were going to stay there for the night, and come to find out that it was four hundred and twenty-nine dollars a night. And we were saying, "What? <laughs> <laughs> Why was it so expensive?" Next thing we knew, somebody else came down, and there was a drink to be served. And this lady that had just sat down said. Halt, meaning half in German, meaning half the price of the drink. And we thought, hmm, yeah, maybe half the price of, the, of what you were charging for the room rate. <laughs> I couldn't figure out what any of this has to do with anything. And I thought, well, maybe, Rosemary, you can help me. Now, this is a hodgepodge, uh, Rosemary. It's do we get some of those? A lot of dreams are like that. And this is why some people think, well, they just can't possibly make sense. So you have to start uh, with individual symbols <clears throat> and uh, take the dream apart little by little. Everything in a dream should um, go through a process of free association. If this were my dream, I, what does Israel represent to me? Uh, and you fire things off the top of your head yeah. uh, and see how those connect with what's going on in your life. Uh, having to pay more for something than you should and then getting a break uh, could relate to um, having to make a decision about something or or um, having to make choices um, 
maybe something isn't such a good deal after all. Um, so all of these things have to be related individually to what you're feeling, what's going on in life, and then put back together in a new symbolic story. That, that is a strange one, though. You have a lot. Now, do some people just, you remember we talk about nightmares, do they simply get them because they had a pizza that night or something? Well, there have been uh, theories going back to ancient times that uh, meals can cause disturbing dreams. But most of the time, our disturbing dreams really are helping dreams because they're calling our attention to areas of life that are out of balance. All of us go through times of turmoil. Uh, We have avoidance things uh, going on or situations where we feel like we just have to put up with something because we don't have any control over it. And the dreams reflect our, our true feelings about those situations. When we are in relationships and situations that uh, go over a long period of time and become very detrimental to us, dreams can get more intense and more negative. It's the, the dreaming way of, of getting our attention to address something that needs um, attention to bring balance back into life. So sometimes the nightmare can be your best friend. All right, next up, we've got the Jessica in St. Augustine. Hey, Jessica, go ahead. Hey, I just wanted to um, compliment both you guys for all the light that you're shedding to everybody. And um, I wanted to ask if uh, both of you, have you ever heard of um, a guy by the name of Kevin Trudeau? Oh, yeah, we've heard of Kevin Trudeau a lot. You know, the uh, government's trying to sanction him. For a number of things, uh, we sure have. But uh, now he doesn't do much about dreams. He's uh, more into uh, alternative medicine and uh, and things like that. I don't think Rosemary. He's not a dream person, is he? Uh, not that I'm aware of. No, I, I don't think so. So that's him, Jessica. Thanks for the uh, compliment, though. Bismarck, North Dakota. Chris, welcome to the show. You're up with us. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, my question is in regards to the jinn and demonic possession. Um, many years ago, I felt like I was about to be possessed, and the thing that brought this back up was talking about the spiritual energy. I had called on basically God to save me, and I felt a burst of energy come from me. And before that, I felt like a really coldness and trying to take over my body, and I was kind of curious as to the jinn in relation to that. Uh, you mean like in terms of how of they possess people? Yeah, I felt like I was going to be possessed, like it was going to take over my body. Uh, I have encountered many individuals who feel that entities have made attempts to take them over, and they've been able to resist. Uh, this may happen more than than uh, we realize because they the case has never progressed to full blown possession. But the jinn have various ways of entering a, a person's physical form, um, oftentimes they will uh, just manipulate thoughts. Uh, Sometimes these instances happen during uh, a nighttime attack. Um, It seems that some people are especially vulnerable then, and uh, that's when the entity will will try and and, um, make some sort of invasion. Uh, So... Uh, demonic possession can happen in similar ways as well. Uh, I, I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure exactly what information you're looking for. Rosemary, when a priest tries to do an exorcism, is he getting out? He's trying to get rid of a jinn? Sometimes they may be dealing with jinn and they think they're dealing with demons. And um, uh, sometimes the entities will resist. Uh, expulsion. Uh, certain demons can do that too. These entities have different levels of strength. Uh, a, a jinn tactic that investigators have come across is uh, uh, kind of um, it's a deception. It's like, oh, I'll make you think you've got rid of me and I'll just go away for a while and then I'll be back. And they're not affected at all by the, the exorcism. They just fake it. They're out there. They're out there in record numbers, I take it. Uh, and uh... I don't know if we'll ever recognize one of these little entities in our lifetime, Rosemary, but uh, I hope I never run into one. 
I hope so, too, George. Uh, if they have an increasing presence on the planet, um, it's quite likely that more of us will be encountering them. You never know. Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Rosemary, thanks again for being on the program. The uh, name of her latest work, of course, is The Gin Connection, and her websites are linked up at coasttocoastam.com. For Dan Galanti, Will Wilkerson, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean Ladasur, Stephanie Smith, Chris Boros, George Knapp, John B. Wellesley, and Punnett and Art Bell. I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe. Everybody.